My name is uh, Julia Grabs. I'm the editor in chief for Jack Case Reports. And today we have the um, uh, webinar, okay, web based case presentation on electrophysiology and pacing. I would like to welcome uh, our senior editorial consultant and director of cardiac pacing and tachyarrhythmia devices from Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Bruce Wilkoff. Welcome, Dr. Wilkoff. Thank you. It's my pleasure to participate. Looking forward and to this. And also, I would like to welcome uh, our associate editors, uh, Dr. Sofian Johar from uh, Ripas Hospital in Brunei. Thank you, jo Sofian. Thank you so much, Julia, for the kind invitation. And Dr. Antonio Surgende from Epicura Medical Center in Belgium. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the invitation. I will start with uh, the first case. Um, let me just press this. And the first case has the title Differential Effects of Vagal Activation of uh, the Sinus and Atrioventricular Nodes, Report of Two Cases. And the first author is Dr. Lauren Suggs, and the last author, Dr. Bexat Parvi from Thomas Jefferson University in uh, Philadelphia. So, who would like to comment on this case? So basically, um, I think uh, I'll start, but the uh, case discusses two uh, reports where they uh, look at the, the uh, sinus node activity and the AV node activity during stimuli such as um, uh, during the uh, gastric, uh, gastroesophageal endoscopy for gastric polyp removal. What they noticed actually was that they saw a period of uh, AV block, but this was actually associated with um, uh, uh, acceleration of the sinus node, which seems a bit paradoxical compared to what we would normally expect to see with pure vagal stimulation. Uh, the heart rate, the sinus rate accelerated to approximately 120 beats per minute. However, uh, AV block still persisted, which uh, they felt was quite unusual. And they looked at a second case where they implanted an implantable loop recorder in a patient with uh, episodes of syncope. Uh, they actually noticed that um, if after a period of time, they noticed a, they picked up an episode of asystole that occurred during episode of nausea uh, with uh, symptoms very, very uh, typical of a vagal event. This was also associated with acceleration of the uh, sinus node rate uh, with a AV block, which was also a bit unusual. And so they speculated that this uh, phenomena may represent differential, uh, act differential stimulation, uh, activation of the um, parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems uh, occurring individual, which, uh, which they say is a bit unusual. So this is uh, just... Uh, ...whether uh, uh, Dr. Comment on this, uh, these findings. So oh, I, I, I do think that uh, it shows the variability that can occur and uh, our, the autonomic nervous system is complex, much more complex than we've ever given it right to be. I mean, when we, uh, I remember as a, uh, uh, as a medical student working on, on dogs and uh, basically stimulating the left versus the right uh, vagal, vagus nerve and we'd get sinus node effects pure versus uh, AV uh, block uh, with the other uh, nerve. It's not that simple with people, but we do see these pure forms where where there's just AV block. It's clear that this was vagal. I mean that this was functional block, uh, and the the clinical scenario is is right. But I uh, sometimes people say, well, if you don't see sinus uh, slowing, it's not vagal, and that's not true. And I, I think these case reports uh, uh, bring that out. Um, of course, you have to look for other reasons for AV block, and and uh, the determin determination of of a need for a pacemaker is a different question altogether. Uh, but uh, you know, certainly symptomatic bradycardia that's not that's going to recur is is definitely a, an indication for a pacemaker. But this is a good, well documented cases of isolated indications of uh, stimulation, particularly the first one, where the heart rate, the atrial rate increased rather than, you know, just stayed the same as it did in the second case. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, I will move to the next case, the second case, um, which has the title, An Elderly Woman with Recurrent Transient Loss of Consciousness, preceded by Hallucinatory Attacks. And the first author is uh, Dr. Bisbrook, and the last author, Dr. Trump, from the San Antonio's Hospital in the Netherlands. So here, uh, what are your comments? Yes, uh, so this is a, a very nice case, especially, I mean, if the, um, the audience can uh, have access to the video. It's a story, it's an history, there's a history of an 89 years old woman who uh, presented the, the emergency department uh, because of recurrent uh, episodes, uh, paroxysmal uh, episodes of uh, um, loss of consciousness. Uh, when unconscious, the patient actually was having uh, uh, visual and auditory complex hallucination. And the, the thing is uh, very clearly that uh, the loss of consciousness was preceding uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, the video is very impressive and actually uh, document, documents very well the associations uh, or the association of the symptom of the patients with uh, the uh, um, changes in the electrocardiograms and in the electroencephalogram. Exactly, you can see that there is an asystole and uh, there is also a, a clear uh, abnormality in the electroencephalography. So, I mean, this is a case where the uh, anamnesis, uh, the history of the patient is really, really uh, strategic and important. In fact, uh, this patient, uh, given the age and the fact uh, that the syncopal events uh, were associated with the hallucinatory events, uh, you know, could be easily uh, diagnosed as epilepsy, uh, whereas the uh, etiology is clearly cardiac, it's clearly uh, bradyarrhythmic. So I'm, I want to congratulate the authors because actually this is a very deductive case and I think uh, or all uh, kind of cardiologists, but uh, I, I think uh, the youngest can really uh, enjoy it. I don't know if uh, Bruce uh, has some comments on, yes. on it. Well, this is clearly a case of, of cardiac epilepsy. And, uh, and that's, and I, I remember uh, a patient of mine uh, who was uh, 100 years old that I saw as a fellow. And uh, he was, he would, he would describe nightmares that he was having uh, as, uh, and it turned out he had a uh, intermittent failure of a, uh, of a lead that okay. he, uh, that, and, and it turned out that his, there, there was direct correlation of his nightmares, um, in this, which are different, obviously, but the hallucinations may be nightmares, I suppose. Uh, wow. He fortunately, that we didn't, we didn't have a video recording like this, but I think this happens more often than we know. And uh, it's not uncommon for a patient to be described as having epileptic uh, uh, activity uh, during what appears to be cardiac uh, 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 event. Uh, it's not our first choice, uh, but I think this is, this is a very well-documented and uh, uh, a case of this with both visual and electroencephalographic. I mean, I think it's kind of fun uh, yeah. to, to see this. We, we all postulate this. We don't get it documented like this very often. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, it's a nice demonstration how, I mean, there could be a multidisciplinary uh, work between a, a neurologist and a cardiologist. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Cleveland Clinic, you are very active in combining you know, the knowledge of uh, both uh, specialties. Uh, so I would like really to congratulate these, uh, these authors. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will move to the next case uh, uh, that has the title Inadvertent uh, dis Disabling of Implantable Cardiac defibr Defibrillator Anti-Tachycardia Therapies Following Breast Reconstructive Surgery. And this is a case from West Virginia University, and the first author is Dr. Paulina Scaff, and the last author, uh, Dr. Christopher Bianco. So we'll start with the background. So perhaps I'll go with uh, this one. So this describes a very interesting case, actually, of a 47-year-old woman who has an ICD implanted and, and had uh, breast cancer surgery with left breast, breast mastectomy. And in this 
instance did it simultaneous reconstruction with a breast tissue expander. Uh, they found that she had intermittent disabling of her ICD, a tachyarrhythmia function of ICD, uh, which appeared to be triggered by the uh, a magnetic port on the breast tissue expander, which is something I didn't readily appreciate, actually. What was also quite interesting is that this seemed to be associated with uh, postural uh, changes, perhaps leading forward, which is illustrated very nicely in the case report. Uh, the indication for the ICD actually was a little bit unclear. It, it was meant, it was uh, indicated for monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, and uh, what happened afterwards was that they actually um, revised the uh, tissue expander with a non-magnetic device. Uh, and basically, uh, this seems to resolve all the episodes. Uh, there's an FDA warning about these devices, actually, and their potential interaction with, the, uh, with an ICD, because the field strength of the magnetic port uh, is similar to that required to actually disable um, tachyarrhythmic functions on ICDs. So I found this particularly interesting. Uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Wilkoff is, uh, would, would you like to comment on the, uh, this case? Sure. I wasn't aware of this interaction. No, uh, well, I'm certainly we're all aware of the potential for a magnet to affect the function of the device. Uh, the, f the fact that the magnet was actually implanted in the patient is an unusual thing. I mean, usually the magnets are somebody carrying a, a speaker or coming yeah. for close to a, a a, uh, some sort of a, uh, a machine of some sort. Uh, and we worry about things like uh, electronic sources like uh, cell phones or such like that. This is, um, this is pr pretty important. Usually, a post mastectomy, the problem is uh, ongoing radiation therapy and such like that. You don't worry about uh, the expander uh, doing this. And I have to add this to my uh, discussion uh, with uh, with the patients uh, and with the, the referring plastic surgeon um, this is a this is clearly a, an issue uh, uh, the, uh, the the magnetic strength does not have to be that big if it's very close because you know it's it's the inverse square law and the magnetic field drops off very quickly and and I think it's this change in posture that you're seeing on the screen here that brought it close enough for it to happen. Um, the other thing that should be noted, though, is that some of the defibrillators can permanently shut off and on the uh, their 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 detection. So it could even be more serious if mm -hmm. if it was programmed to a, a mode where it could be permanently disabled. Uh, but it's a good warning and something that we should keep in mind. Thank you very much. Um, if I may um, move to the fourth case that has um, the title actually cardiac transplantation for refractory catecholin. Sorry, I'm sorry, apologies for that. Uh, Catecholinergic polymorphic VT. I'm really sorry for the. This is a word that ever since I was a medical student, I couldn't pronounce. Maybe <laughs> that's why I'm an imager. It has <laughs> simpler terms. And the first author here is Dr. Simon Roy. The last author, Dr. Kenneth Ellen Bogen from Virginia Commonwealth University and Poly Heart Center. So, yes, I, I suppose I'll go and discuss this case. I mean, it's a really nice case. Uh, the authors uh, present a patient with the CPVT. Donc, uh, we, we can actually uh, make a, a a reduction of the catecholaminergic uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the patient uh, is really unfortunate because uh, actually he failed the maximal anti-arrhythmic drug therapy and uh, he got also bilateral sympathetic denervation. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he actually went through uh, recurrent episodes of ventricular tachycardia and he, after, of course, the implantation of an ICD, he received uh, 21 consecutive shocks. Uh, so the only uh, solution that actually uh, was left for this patient was to undergo a cardiac transplantation, which fortunately uh, took place. And uh, this has solved uh, the issue uh, uh, of the clinical issue in this uh, uh, patient. 
So you can actually uh, see in the in the slide, uh, you know, how many uh, shocks uh, the patient uh, received consecutively, you know, from 3.02 p.m. to 3.10 p.m. And if you go forward on the slides, uh, you can actually appreciate uh, uh, here that uh, the uh, there was uh, uh, actually, the, uh, the the device ended up uh, uh, not being able to uh, provide any further shock, and uh, fortunately, for some reason that I can't explain, I'm curious to know if <laughs> there is uh, someone could give this explanation. The episodes of VF terminated there, so there was like a sort of a perfect combination of the you know uh, the device capacity of giving shock and the episode of the app. So I think, I mean, here we can say that there was something uh, supernatural intervening and saving this uh, poor patient. Um, uh, that's it. I mean, that's an interesting case. I mean, we have to understand that, uh, and we have, uh, you know, to underscore uh, that, um, you know, cardiac transplant could be uh, the uh, final uh, uh, pathway for uh, patients with uh, also uh, catecholaminergic uh, ventricular polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And uh, I think this is a, a nice didactic case uh, on uh, uh, a very, very unusual uh, uh, um, clinical scenario. I don't, I don't know if, I mean, uh, I'm just curious to, under, to understand uh, if uh, Bruce has some suggestion about the function of the device in this case, or if you have any particular advice on how to program the device in such a clinical setting? Well, I don't think there is a good way of doing the, the device. What you want to do is uh, you want to eliminate the sort of the positive reinforcement or the positive feedback between the shocks and the catecholamines and the more tachycardia. And to do that, you want to you want to terminate the tachycardia as quickly as possible because it, it, I think the reason this stopped was because you stopped stimulating with more shocks right. and um, you got less catecholamines and you got less unstable uh, yes. situation. Yes. I, 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 and so it's the same reason that we use beta blockers um, in VT storms um, or um, actually put people to sleep, you know, sedate them and, and uh, put them on. To, to get rid of the, the kind of, kind of not, you don't have to have CPVT in order for this to happen. Um, yes, yes. And it's not that unusual, it's not common, but it's not that unusual to find a person where they exhaust the therapies from the shocks without terminating. But then when you go back to measure DFTs later on, the DFTs are fine. So I don't think this is because the defibrillator was not capable or producing a voltage gradient across the heart that was proper. I think it was because the, 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 the substrate was too unstable. Um, and that defibrillators are no good for um, uh, for frequently recurring VT as, as well. Um, so in any case, uh, the, the problem is there are certain conditions where where you really have to you just have to change the circumstance altogether. And this was a good solution here. Although I must say, well, I don't know of, of cases where this happens uh, uh, often. And usually there are other solutions in controlling the uh, catechol catecholaminergic uh, drive on these patients. Yes, uh, very good point. I, I uh, really, uh... Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, with with the point that uh, you know more shocks uh, uh, are giving more adrenergic uh, uh, surge, and so I mean the the fact that the the the, the device stopped uh, giving shocks was a sort of uh, uh, temp temporary uh, therapy for this patient. And uh, right. it's true also that uh, ventricular storm are treated with uh, general anesthesia very often. Yes, that's a good, very good point. Thank you very much, uh, both. Uh, the next case has the title Direct Current Ablation of the Deep uh, Substrate Arrhythmia. And the first author is uh, Dr. Young, the last author, Dr. Mikkelsen, from uh, the Division of uh, Cardiovascular Medicine uh, in University of Iowa 
hospitals in the United States. So, uh, this one is uh, extremely, uh, this is actually quite interesting. It actually um, kind of recapitulates the history of ablation. But basically, this describes a, 60, a case of a 61 year old male with a dilated cardiomyopathy with recurrent VT. Uh, he has a CRTD device implanted and basically has had multiple uh, recurrent shocks refracted to medical therapy. He underwent uh, four previous VT ablations prior to this, this, um, uh, prior to this coming for, to the lab. And uh, what was noticed was that he had a, a septal substrate, uh, which was, uh, is not unusual in these patients, actually. But the problem with the septal substrate is that it's quite difficult to actually reach the um, presumed point of origin of the ventricular tachycardia or the circuit in order to perform an ablation procedure. Uh, so conventionally, uh, what we sort of tend to do is uh, we uh, map one side, then the other, and then uh, ablate uh, one side or the other. Uh, there are a couple of different uh, potential ablation configurations one could use, including bipolar, conventional bipolar ablation, or if it happens to be adjacent to a structure which is more easily accessible, then perhaps you could ablate from there. Um, what's interesting in this particular case is that they attempted to use uh, direct current ablation. Now, direct current ablation is what we used to use right way back in the beginning. The pioneers of EP will uh, remember this, where you actually connected um, uh, electrodes to a defibrillator and basically uh, 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 discharged a large amount of energy, you know, usually over 500 joules. Uh, I think it was a uniphasic in those days, uh, in order to ablate the AV node. So uh, in this case, they used um, a bipolar defibrillator to deliver energy uh, after uh, wire using um, their own wiring method uh, in order to actually deliver uh, current between two adjacent ablation catheters, uh, adjacent to the septum. And they confirmed this with uh, intracardiac echo and uh, other methods in order to make sure that they were ablating the right area. Uh, so after several applications, the tachycard VT was rendered non-inducible uh, and the patient was free of VT. The, v the VT actually did recur uh, uh, four months later, uh, uh, but uh, you know, and they repeated the procedure and the patient seemed to do quite well afterwards. But I think reading between the lines in the case report, I'm not sure the patient was totally cured of VT. So I, I think this represents a kind of an interesting uh, take on um, a very difficult substrate. Other people have suggested uh, using uh, RF uh, needle ablation. Uh, for those of you who uh, irrigated RF needle catheter, for those who have access to that, uh, it's possible that uh, the substrate may actually be um, adjacent to one of the septal uh, perforate septal uh, branches of the LAD, uh, so that's another, and people have tried ethanol infusion. Uh, sort of like an um, interesting uh, method which you can use to all treat the same uh, underlying, very difficult, uh, often intractable problem. And actually, uh, some of these patients actually end up with uh, transplantation. So I thought this was an extremely uh, interesting case. I'm not sure quite how often we'll be using it in uh, real life, uh, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's something that we need to think about if we're dealing with these uh, patients. So the patient at least has, a, has a, had at least six VT ablations and uh, maybe actually more or has, has required transplantation by now. Right. You know, I may be the only person that has more experience with DC ablations than with RF ablations. <laughs> um, because I stopped doing DC ablations about when I started doing started doing lead extractions, but uh, DC ablations in the past um, were 360 joule, uh, which is 900 to 1,000 volts, which is much different than what's being described here. And those the, and they were they were unipolar, so uh, they were monophasic and unipolar, and they went to a grounding pad. And the, and it would melt the platinum that was in the electrodes, um, so you got one shot with every uh, catheter. So this being between seventy and a hundred, uh, uh, you know, this is this is this is this is uh, a much lower energy, much lower current, 
uh, and no evidence of of you know causing the kind of destruction that was that was, that was caused to the catheter. I mean, they we definitely got much larger lesions, so this is good, um, and this would be a good way of doing that. I, I would agree with you, though. Uh, I think what we're trying to do, if I, as a of an observer rather than a, a practitioner of this is to get more control, not less. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that this is as this is this is more of a sledgehammer than uh, the other. But but they had a problem. They had they had to find a, a way of, of working on this, and um, at least temporarily, they've gotten themselves in a good in a good place here. Yes, I guess, uh, I mean, one reason uh, that they use uh, direct uh, uh, current is that probably uh, there was a sort of mechanical uh, barrier to the radio frequency to reach the critical isthmus. And so, I mean, they thought that with the direct current uh, uh, cardioversion, they could actually uh, overcome this obstacle and uh, get rid of the uh, critical uh, circuit uh, or isthmus of the tachycardia. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, if uh, that's fine with you, I will move to the next case. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I learned a lot actually from from these cases, and and from the discussion. The next case has a title: coronary arterial vasospasm, a rare complication of the vein of Marshall ethanol infusion with atrial fibrillation. And the first author is Dr. Maeda, and the last author, Dr. Hirao, and the. Authors are coming from the Arrhythmia Center, Tokyo Medical and Dental University. Yes, I mean, this is a, a nice case actually uh, came just after the publication of uh, the trial on uh, alcoholic ablation of the vein of Marshall in patient with the uh, uh, drug refractory persistent atrial fibrillation. So, I mean, it's just uh, on time. And uh, the case describes uh, a 75 years old man uh, who actually was admitted for a repeat ablation of atrial fibrillation. So uh, the protocol that the, the authors uh, used was the uh, infusion of 3.5 milliliters of ethanol into the vein of Marshall, which projects to the posterior wall of the left atrium. And uh, what they actually observed, so actually this actually rather fits with the a sort of uh, complication case that they observe a, a inferior ST segment elevation uh, pretty much the, um, after uh, the uh, infusion of uh, the ethanol. So they actually did the, a coronary angiogram, uh, and uh, the angiogram actually showed, uh, uh, I mean, the video probably uh, can also be. Uh, uh, yes, they actually showed that it was actually a, a vasospasm of the uh, circumflex artery. So, I mean, this is um, a case that highlights, uh, you know, uh, the importance of being uh, really cautious when uh, uh, uses the, this technique, probably to uh, have a close look to the electrocardiogram uh, in order to uh, prevent uh, and uh, to observe any uh, change uh, uh, that could be related to coronary vasospasm. I, I found it uh, really interesting. Uh, fortunately for the patient, there was no uh, consequence, uh, but I mean, this is a warning when uh, doing uh, um, alcohol ablation uh, through the vein uh, of Marshall. Uh, um, of course, it, it depends on the uh, amount of uh, ethanol that uh, you're giving and on the reactivity of uh, each patient. But I think it's something uh, uh, to be taken into account when adopting uh, this uh, technique. Perfect. Um, I don't know if you have any other comments. Otherwise, I will move to the next uh, case. Uh, which is the left pericardiophrenic vein pacing for tachybrady syndrome due to an obstructing cardiac angiosarcoma. And here the first author is Dr. Gregory Siroki, the last author Dr. William Costis from uh, Rogers Robert Wood Johnson Medical Group. Uh, could we have the next uh, slide, actually? Thanks. Okay, so this is actually quite an interesting case uh, where they... Um, use an unusual location of um, uh, 
uh, placing a permanent pacemaker lead. So this was a woman with a history of hypothyroidism with, who presented with a history of uh, progressive dyspnea and left-sided rib pain. So basically, um, the uh, way the conventional route to place a lead via the uh, left subclavian and into the uh, right heart uh, was obstructed by the angiosarcoma. So basically, they took the opportunity to uh, actually place a uh, pacing lead via the uh, left cardiophrenic vein. I must admit, I didn't realize it was a potential way to actually um, pace someone but I guess it's uh, something that they managed to do. Uh, obviously, this potentially has a, a problem with, in terms of relationship to the left phrenic nerve, which I think they had problems with uh, actually after, after the procedure. Can I have the next slide, please? The next, uh, the next. Oh, we don't have one, okay. So, but basically the, uh, what the angiogram actually sees, shows the course of the left cardiophrenic vein, and you can see they took the opportunity to actually place a pacing lead down there. Probably is quite difficult to maneuver pacing lead down that uh, small vein, but they managed to do it successfully. Um, after the um, uh, after a period of time, the the patient went underwent definitive um, treatment for her uh, her angiosarcoma, and basically they managed to inf implant a conventional system. Uh, this time, though, they took the opportunity to implant a his bundle pacing system. Uh, which uh, resulted in uh, quite a uh, nice, uh, narrow uh, QRS. So um, this, I guess, case highlights the potential. Uh, you always th have to think a little bit outside the box in terms of deciding where to uh, place a pacing lead if uh, the conventional options are not open to you. Uh, and uh, But unfortunately, in this case, um, because of the position of the pacing lead, it was fairly close to the uh, phrenic nerve. So they did run into problems with this. So. Uh, in the end, they had to put in a different system. So, um, actually, quite an interesting case. Uh, I just wonder whether uh, Dr. Wilcock has any comments about pacing in unusual location. Sure. So, it has been done uh, to pace, but it has been used particularly for uh, diaphragmatic paralysis or more specifically for uh, people with sleep apnea. So there's a stimulator that uses the, the, the left pericardiophrenic uh, nerve this way or in the SVC to stimulate to prevent apnea uh, in particular. So that may be where they got the idea, although they didn't mention that. Uh, and then uh, here, the, the problem is, is that it clearly does parallel the phrenic nerve, which is the intended target actually, uh, to get that without pacing the heart. So in, in those cases, they pace on top of the QRS so that uh, you don't get uh, cardiac stimulation. Uh, you know, it's a pretty elegant solution. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that um, that it, it was a good for the patient here. This patient ultimately needed the resection of this tumor. Uh, once you resect the tumor, uh, you you have the, the the whole surface of the heart to put pacemaker leads on, which is a very very uh, uh, appropriate way of of going about it uh, in in this particular patient. Uh, it it is only uh, temporarily useful, uh, and it, it it's it's wonder whether uh, even a his bundle pacer was necessary. But having done this, it, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, that they were able to do this, uh, having, uh, as we know from CRT, uh, repetitive uh, uh, phrenic stimulation at the same time that the cardiac stimulation is not a solution to anything. Uh, it, it's a, a problem. And in this case, your, your intended target is the heart, uh, but you're right on top of the phrenic nerve. This is like the... Uh, the like like the the LV lead from hell. Uh, yes. <laughs> because, yes, uh, definitely. It, it seems like you're always going to get that phrenic nerve when, uh, but uh, in this case, it, it was unavoidable. Uh, but it, it but it is elegant. Perfect. Very interesting. Um, thank you very much. Um, to know alternative access actually, and. Uh, 
the, I'll move to the next case uh, for for the time. It's not pressing, but it's good to keep it short. Um, so case eight is the non-invasive 3D mapping and ablation um, of um, epicardial premature ventricular contractions from the endocardial aspect of the left atrial appendage. And the first author is Dr. Justus Obergassel. The last author, Dr. Sabine Ernst from Royal Brompton and Harefield Hostels in London. Yes, I mean, uh, to make it short, uh, Julia, this is really a nice case. I encourage uh, uh, the, you know, ablationists to, to have a look. I mean, there's a combination of things that are really exceptional. Uh, first of all, the use of this uh, non-invasive uh, uh, imaging system to locate uh, the origin of uh, uh, premature ventricular contraction. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ernst uh, is promoting, uh, you know, this kind of system uh, just, uh, I think, because uh, it allows to uh, uh, locate without, uh, uh, without any error, it's very accurate, the location of the uh, um, premature ventricular contraction ahead of the procedure. So actually this can help the uh, electrophysiologist to uh, plan the procedure in a, in, a, in a fashion that actually can be helpful for the patient itself. And to summarize, I mean, this is actually a, a, a PVC that is originating from the uh, left uh, ventricular su uh, summit. Uh, and the, as, uh, as everybody knows, this is a very tough area. Uh, it can have uh, multiple anatomical uh, um, differences uh, between patients. And in this case, uh, they actually find out that, uh, you know, the, the left atrial appendage was actually... Uh, uh, superseding the left ventricular summit. So they decided to approach the uh, PVC from, uh, uh, you know, the left atrial appendage. They did a transeptal puncture. And so they were able to place uh, uh, the radio frequency application at the base of the appendage, getting rid of uh, uh, the premature ventricular contraction. Very nice case, very didactic with also good uh, uh, imaging. Perfect. Um... Any other comments or? No, I will move uh, to the next case that has the title long term follow up of cardiac ablation to treat second degree block after slow pathway ablation. And the first author is uh, Dr. Vasallo, the last author, Dr. Lovato from Santa Rita de Cassia Hospital. Hi, thanks, Julia. I'll, I'll take this one. Could I have the uh, next slide, please? This is actually uh, fascinating, actually, this um, uh, to actually propose uh, ablation treatment for AV block. Uh, essentially, this is a young uh, woman who's 31 who actually presented initially with SVT and underwent uh, sort of conventional slow pathway ablation for AV and RT, but she presented uh, some months later with uh, dizziness and um, uh, presyncope. Uh, and basically, they showed uh, that the patient had further. sort of evidence of first and secondary heart block uh, during times of uh, uh, higher heart rate. So um, what they also noted was that this was responsive to uh, atropine. So they speculated, actually, that rather than being an intrinsic problem with the AV node, which is one one would think after a slow pathway ablation in case you inadvertently damage the fast pathway, that it was related to a high vagal tone. So what they did was they targeted the ganglionic plexi in the left and right atrium uh, in order to normalize uh, AV conduction, uh, which they uh, did, which they did quite successfully actually, and the patient's been free of a pacemaker. Uh, so this, this this is something that's uh, been coming up in literature. It's actually quite interesting. I I guess it may be useful for patients where who are symptomatic because of um, uh, with uh, with uh, heart block because of high vagal tone as an alternative uh, method uh, instead of implanting a pacemaker. I think it remains to be seen as to whether it's going to be something that we will do in the long term and we need more data, but it certainly describes a very interesting approach. Um, I don't know what my colleagues think of this, but I found this quite interesting. So I found it quite interesting as well. Uh, the, um, my, my concern, and I, I've been talking to my, my colleagues as after I read this, was that um, the durability of this response, because uh, pacing is not a particularly good answer for this problem. 
I mean, you'd have to go to either uh, to get you a nice fluoresce and, and such like that. You have to go to his bundle pacing, which may not have good thresholds and uh, yeah, exactly. or maybe left bundle pacing uh, still to, but if this is a, proves to be a durable uh, response uh, because uh, they can re re innovate uh, as I understand. So, but if it's durable, it could become uh, a, a therapy that would be targeted for some of these vagal bradycardias. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, uh, the only thing that I find a little bit uh, difficult at the moment, but I think uh, as uh, it, it, it happened with uh, pulmonary vein isolation, we need a little bit more standardization of the treatment because, uh, you know, um, reading uh, uh, the, the papers that uh, come out, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, unclear, you know, and uh, everyone has uh, its own approach to uh, found uh, the location of the gangrenate uh, plexi. So uh, that's uh, something that should be, in my um, view, standardized more, and probably, uh, you know, it will come with uh, inter international randomized trials. Interesting. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. Um, the next case has a title, Recurrent Left Plural Effusion Following Left, append left Atrial Appendage Closure with the Watchman device. And the first author is Dr. Rin Halabi, the last author, Dr. Pasquale Sandangeli, who is also one of our associate editors as well, from the University of Pennsylvania. Yes, um, uh, we'll take this one. I mean, I, I think, I mean, this is uh, a kind of unusual case uh, should uh, uh, gather attention. For that, there is a, a, a case of uh, it is a case of a 75-year-old woman uh, who underwent uh, a left atrial appendage closure with the Watchman device. Um, after the implantation, actually, she uh, was admitted for uh, the occurrence of uh, pleura left pleura effusion. And so, I mean, the, the patient underwent uh, uh, multiple uh, imaging, including uh, a TEE, including a, a CT scan. And uh, actually what was clear that uh, there was a, an association between the device implantation and the left uh, uh, pleura uh, device, uh, the left uh, um, appendage closure device implantation. So um, this is a, a, a very rare complication of this uh, uh, device. Uh, I think, I mean, we need to consider it uh, for the future. Uh, it, it's, it's not uh, uh, very, uh, you know, intuitive uh, to think that a left player effusion could be related to uh, an, a left atrial appendage closure. But in the end, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, the device could somehow uh, irritate uh, the left pleura. And this is actually uh, the reason why uh, the uh, effusion uh, uh, could appear. So good, uh, uh, good uh, teaching case as well. Thank you very much, um, Antonio. Um, and the last case has a title, Catheter Ablation of Atrioventricular Block from Diagnosed Selection of Proper Treatment. And the first author is Dr. Erkan Beisal, and the last author, Dr. Tolga Aksu from uh, Kosaili uh, Derin's Training and Research Hospital. Okay, thanks, uh, Julia. I'll take this one. Actually, this is uh, fairly similar to the uh, case before last, uh, except this time it occurs in a 39-year-old uh, man who presented with um, recurrent syncope. So uh, they noticed on a 24-hour halter, again, that uh, we saw persistent uh, Mobitz type 1 and high-degree AV block. And uh, this was uh, recapitulated during head-up tilt testing where they noticed a pause with a uh, um, prolonged pause during tilt testing uh, with uh, AV block noticed uh, during head up tilt. So again, um, they postulated that this was really related to high vagal tone. Uh, they looked at the response to atropine and found that the, uh, uh, the AV nodal conduction improved and AV uh, block resolved. So again, like in the previous case, they had some concerns about the uh, planting and permanent pacemaker here as the, uh, they were worried about the high, potential high potential uh, for ventricular pacing because of the baseline first free heart block. 
So again, they uh, targeted the ganglion plexi in the um, left and uh, right side and managed to achieve a durable response. Again, the lesion set, as um, was commented by Antonio, uh, is not quite clear in terms of uh, the, uh, the selection process of which uh, ganglion plexi they targeted. Uh, they targeted some on the left, but it didn't work. They targeted some on the right and achieved a durable response. So there seems to be a real um, cry for standardization of this procedure. And like uh, Antonio echoed the need for uh, randomized controlled trials to prove the effectiveness of the therapy. And like Dr. Wilkoff uh, mentioned earlier, we are still concerned about the durability of this approach. Uh, I think we only, in, in general, we only have a few years of um, uh, doing this procedure. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the long-term outcomes. These are young patients who are being ablated uh, in their 20s and 30s. So it'll be interesting to see what happens later on in life. But a very interesting case again. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Any comments from uh, Dr. Wilco for Antonio? Or any comments in general? Because we reached the end of, uh, of uh, this um, webinar. Like so I, I yes, I, I think, I mean, uh, there was uh, a very uh, good selection of cases and uh, I would uh, uh, encourage uh, the audience to give a look to these cases because, I mean, they are not only uh, uh, given, uh, giving uh, the possibility to learn something that is unusual, but actually, especially these cases on the cardioneural ablation are kind of uh, uh, the beginning of uh, a new era in the in the field of cardiac pacing so i'm i'm just uh, curious uh, you know to see how the our expectation will be uh, fulfilled in the future and if these uh, case reports uh, that we presented can be really the opening uh, uh, the, they're opening a pathway uh, towards uh, you know a new a new treatment that's always uh, something uh, good to be uh, at the time where uh, something uh, begins. I think uh, Bruce can say something. Uh, he, he began yeah. a lot of uh, things in uh, career facing and uh, a lot of uh, uh, innovations are actually uh, have, uh, the, 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 the name of Bruce on, on them. And so I guess, I mean, uh, this is something really uh, that uh, gives, uh, gives enthusiasm and that actually promotes uh, research and uh, uh, old research efforts. In this era of uh, COVID and pandemic, that is not easy. No, uh, the germ of an idea is something to be uh, treasured. And, and the beginnings, that's where the imagination just starts. And I think innovation has been characteristic of this field all along. Uh, and uh, innovation starts with, uh, I wonder, and uh, and, here are some um, some thoughts. Um, I, I, the case reports, the nature of a case report is to start that I wonder. And then yeah. it also is um, some caveats to, to see, you know, well, what happens when um, you get a, a breast expander and a magnet and, and such like that. I mean, those kind of warnings or, uh, the idea of being able to ablate a, a PVC from the atrium. Uh, these are things that may not have occurred to you. And then the understanding, even though they may be immature thoughts, they may not com be complete ideas, uh, they start you to be creative. And I, I, I really enjoyed our session and our discussions today. Uh, thanks, I would like to uh, e echo that. But um, actually, I found the most interesting case, actually, the 89-year-old woman with the uh, auditory hallucinations during her syncopal episode. Uh, that's sort of like, it's, I think as a cardiologist, we forget a little bit about <laughs> neurology and we forget about the EEG. And I must admit, I, I would be totally uh, a beginner in trying to even understand uh, what uh, the waves, they're both electrophysiology, but one is totally different uh, yes. uh, on the brain. Uh, and certainly nice to see, and it's a very elegant way. Perhaps we should, you know, dedicated syncope units uh, do have uh, close collaboration with neurologists with a more routine uh, video, EEG, uh, even combining with tilt testing, etc. So uh, I wonder whether this actually is something we should be thinking about more often, 
uh, for just a general cardiologist in terms of uh, how they approach these things. But that, to me, was my favorite case of the year. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic, yes. yes. Perfect. So, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, it's a great honor to have you here for this uh, webinar. To the audience, I will just remind subscribe to Jack Specialty Journal's podcast and to follow the YouTube account under American College of Cardiology. And thank you very much again for participating to this interesting webinar. Thank you. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, everybody. It's been a thank pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you.